What is the address where you need this to come? One, 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 one thirty, Z-Max. Oh, my She's, she's, she's on the floor. Oh, my God. Okay, just take a couple deep breaths for me. <laughs> Russell, how long were you gone today? I, I, I left around five, and I just got back. But she was Betsy Feria had recently developed cancer and was undergoing chemotherapy treatment. At some point, her condition worsened, and the police were called to Betsy's house. Betsy had died, but not from cancer. She had become the victim of a murder. In our first case, we will talk about the tragic end of Betsy Feria and the diabolical scheme in her murder case. Additionally, we will witness the disappearance of a girl and the gruesome discovery in a riverbed. Brace yourselves, we're stepping into the crime scene now. Betsy Meyer was born on March 24, 1969, in Sumac Drive, Missouri. In her youth, she was in a long-term relationship and had two daughters, whom she raised alone after the separation. Later, Betsy remarried, but this marriage also ended. To support her family, she worked at a gas station and organized DJ events for parties on the side. Betsy met Russell at a party and their friendship gradually blossomed into love, leading to their marriage in 2000. They enjoyed camping, playing volleyball, going to bars, and playing board games. Betsy later switched jobs from the gas station to an insurance office, where she befriended her co-worker Pam Hupp. They quickly became close friends but grew apart after Pam left the job. In 2010, Betsy found out she had breast cancer. The first treatment worked, but in 2011, the cancer came back and went to her liver. The doctor said she probably wouldn't survive. She kept fighting and going through chemotherapy. Betsy didn't give up though. During Christmas, Betsy and Russell attended a party where their behavior raised concerns among Betsy's family, revealing new problems. Their marriage had its issues and they would argue often. Betsy's teenage daughters had moved out earlier to live with relatives, probably due to the arguments. On December 27th, Betsy went to St. Louis for chemotherapy and Pam went with her. However, a friend of the family, Bobby Wan, messaged Pam and requested that she not come over so that Betsy could have time with her. Betsy rested and spent time playing board games with her family at her mother's house after treatment. Later that evening, after Pam dropped her off at home in St. Louis, Russell called 911 to report Betsy's death, which appeared to be a suicide. What is the address where you need this to come? One, 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 one thirty, Z-Max. Well, I killed herself. She's, she's, she's on the floor. Oh my God, God. Okay, just take a couple deep breaths for me. <laughs> Russell, how long were you gone today? Uh, I, I left around five, and I just got back. But she was at her mom's. First responders discovered Betsy with a knife in her neck and multiple stab wounds raising doubts about the theory of suicide. The state of the crime scene indicated that the murder took place hours before the authorities arrived. Russell was detained for questioning. He claimed he left work around 5 p.m. and had spoken with Betsy earlier that day, aware she was due to return home. Instead of going directly home, he went to a game night with a few friends. Security camera footage and testimonies from his friends confirmed it. Russell claimed he hadn't entered the bedroom. However, police found blood on the light switch and bloodied slippers in his closet. During the investigation, the police discovered that Russell had a history of physically abusing Betsy, including placing a pillow on her face to pretend she was dead. They also found out that Betsy had altered her $300,000 life insurance policy just four days before her death to add Pam as the beneficiary because she was afraid of Russell's reckless attitude towards money. 
Russell was apprehended on January 4, 2012, and accused of first-degree murder. Russell's defense attorney uncovered multiple problems with the case, such as insufficient proof from the prosecution. Although security camera footage supported his claim and his clothing lacked blood from the day of the murder, Russell still failed a polygraph test. His guilt was indicated by the presence of the bloody slippers in the switch. During the trial, Pam Hupp's dramatic testimony confirmed she left Betsy in good condition and identified Russell as the murderer. Despite the defense's attempts to accuse Pam, the jury convicted Russell of first-degree murder and armed criminal action, resulting in a life sentence without parole. His lawyer appealed the conviction, alleging ethical misconduct and questionable rulings in the prosecution. Following Russell's sentencing, Pamela's refusal to release the insurance funds to Betsy's daughters led to a legal battle. Pamela triumphed in the lawsuit, avoiding payment to the daughters. The lawyer started to investigate Pamela and found out that her mother had recently passed away by falling from the nursing home balcony. Intrigued by the intricate story, Dateline producers cooperated with the defense team to reopen the case. They engaged an engineer to analyze the balcony fall, and he concluded that the balcony railings had been severely damaged making it unlikely for the fall to occur naturally. Pamela brought her mother to the hospital for back pain the day before her passing and told the nursing home staff that her mother would miss meals the next day. Subsequently, a maid discovered her employer, Pamela's mother, motionless in her room. Pamela received a large sum of money from her mother's life insurance policies. In 2015, Russell Faria's guilty verdicts were reversed, setting him free. But prosecutor Leah Aske was adamant about retrying and imprisoning him. Pamela frequently changed her story and refused to provide financial support to Betsy's daughters, highlighting her unreliability as a witness. During the investigation, the defense attorney uncovered a mysterious letter saved on Betsy's computer that Pamela had mentioned. The letter was created shortly before Betsy's death. The sole document on Betsy's computer, apparently written by an unidentified author, was created using Windows 98. The lawyer thinks Pamela wrote this paper four days before Betsy died. This aligns with the day Betsy changed who would get her life insurance money. Further investigation into Pamela uncovered her history of fraud resulting in her dismissal from multiple jobs. Prior to Russell's second trial, Pamela gave a peculiar statement to the police. She claimed to have been in a romantic relationship with Betsy and her subsequent stories became increasingly bizarre. On August 16, 2016, a 911 call was made from Pamela's residence reporting a break-in. During the call, Pamela could be heard yelling at the intruder before shooting them five times. When police arrived, they found the body of 33-year-old Louis Gumpenberger in the hallway of Pamela's home. Pamela said Louis attacked her in the garage and tried to kidnap her, forcing her to shoot him. In Louis's pocket, police found a note with instructions to abduct Pamela, take money from Russell, and murder her. This led Pamela to suspect that Lewis was hired by Russell Faria, whom she also accused of killing Betsy. Russell was questioned, but had a strong alibi. The investigation showed that Lewis Gumpenberger had survived a car accident in 2005 and had suffered brain injuries, which left him partially disabled. Contradictorily, Pamela claimed to have shot Lewis using both hands, despite being on a 911 call during the shooting. While the Charles police were skeptical of Pamela's story, the Lincoln County inspectors found it credible. A neighbor of Louis came forward and identified a woman who matched Pamela's description and had approached him a week before the murder. The lady, called Pamela Hupp, pretended to work for Dateline and proposed to pay $1,000 to simulate an emergency call at her place. When Louis died, he had $900 in $100 bills on him, the same type of bill found at Pamela's house. 
Pamela Hupp was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. Prosecutors believed that her intention was to blame Russell Faria for the homicide. Security cameras filmed Pamela looking for someone in Louis's area who could be helped by money. Carol was the first person Pamela approached, but when Carol found the request odd, she refused to go to Pamela's home. A week later, Pamela returned and succeeded in trapping Lewis. Consequently, Pamela Hupp was sentenced to life in prison without parole. In July 2021, District Attorney Mike Wood charged Pamela Hupp with the murder of Betsy Faria and requested an investigation into the Lincoln County inspectors involved in the original investigation. Eventually, Leah Askey got fired and Mike Wood became the new state prosecutor. Russell eventually started dating Carol, the woman whom Pamela failed to deceive. He sued the Lincoln County inspectors for wrongly accusing him and is now seeking justice. Before we dive into our next story, if you could take a moment to hit that like button, it would mean the world to us. A single click for you is a huge boost of encouragement for us. Kevin and Melissa Fox, who fell in love while attending high school in Wilmington, Illinois, had their first child, Tyler, when they were young. They then married, and soon their second child, Riley, was born. Riley was a lively and affectionate girl who was loved by her family. In the spring of 2004, while attending Kevin's brother's wedding, the Fox family captured what would unknowingly be their last family photo together. On June 5, 2004, Kevin went to a concert with his sister's husband while Melissa was in Chicago. When they returned late, Kevin picked up the kids from his grandparents' house. Despite being late, they stayed overnight. Kevin tucked Riley and Tyler in on the couch. The next morning, Tyler woke Kevin up to say that Riley was missing. Kevin searched the house thoroughly, but couldn't find Riley. In a state of panic, he dialed 911 and informed Melissa with a trembling voice, Riley's gone. A large-scale search began on June 6th. In the meantime, authorities found no signs of forced entry at the Fox residence, except for a damaged lock on the back door. Later that evening, a horrifying discovery was made by a volunteer in the search team, the lifeless body of three-year-old Riley in a creek, face down. The autopsy revealed that Riley had drowned, with indications of being restrained and attacked. Evidence was carefully gathered and sent to the FBI crime lab in Quantico. At the same time, a burglary was reported opposite the Fox residence. A red Beretta was sighted in the neighborhood early that morning. Nevertheless, the police did not establish a connection between the burglary and Riley's killing. Kevin Fox was the police's main suspect, and they initiated an investigation into him. Every person who knew Kevin denied his involvement, including seven-year-old Tyler, who underwent extensive questioning. Months went by with no progress in the investigation. Later, security footage from a store showed a car like Kevin's leaving the area early that morning. The police summoned Kevin and Melissa to the station citing significant new evidence. Upon arriving, they were separated, and Kevin was accused of killing his daughter. Even though he denied the accusations, Kevin was threatened and scolded by the police. He agreed to a polygraph test, which he reportedly failed, and the police continued their aggressive interrogation. Melissa was informed that Kevin had murdered Riley, but she did not believe it. After 14 hours of questioning, the police suggested the possibility of an accidental death. Overwhelmed with exhaustion and feeling cornered, Kevin finally broke down and confessed to the unthinkable, hitting Riley with a doorknob and disposing of her body in the creek. The police arrested Kevin for first-degree murder, but later he disavowed his statement, alleging that it was coerced. In a heated electoral battle, Will County Prosecutor Jeff Tomsack faced off against his formidable opponent, James Glasgow. 
Many thought he had to win a big case to ensure his re-election. A few weeks prior to the election, Kevin Fox was arrested, but James Glasgow still won. The state sought the death penalty for Kevin while he was in jail. Other inmates knew about his case. Kevin was scared for his life, but his family hired a great lawyer who was known for helping innocent people. Upon meticulously reviewing the case, the lawyer made a shocking discovery. The FBI had neglected to test the DNA samples taken from Riley's body. In a startling revelation, the new state's attorney, James Glasgow, uncovered a grave oversight during his discussions with the FBI. The Will County detectives told the FBI not to test the samples once Kevin was arrested. Luckily, the new DNA testing showed that Kevin wasn't the one who committed the crime. Kevin was let out of prison, his wife Melissa always believing in his innocence. Kevin and Melissa Fox filed a lawsuit against Will County. Despite being cleared of all charges, they were still labeled as child killers. Kevin won his case and was awarded $8.5 million. After Kevin's release, the investigation into Riley's death was reopened. The FBI eventually took over the case five years after the murder. A woman contacted the detectives, saying her boyfriend, who was recently released on parole, made unsettling comments regarding the murder. He had a rough upbringing, plagued with abuse and started breaking the law when he was young. Eby, despite his marriage, mistreated his wife, which ultimately led to their divorce. In 2004, he resided with his mother, just two miles away from the Fox family's home. The FBI discovered that Eby had tried to take his own life several times, including the day Riley vanished. The police didn't link the two incidents when they searched the area. Initially, Scott vehemently denied any involvement in Riley's murder in prison, but in a twist, he later confessed to his mother, solidifying his guilt with a written suicide note. He then tried to kill himself, but survived. Scott admitted to the FBI that he broke into homes while under the influence of drugs and alcohol. He found Riley's unlocked door and entered the house. He saw Riley and Tyler in the living room and made the choice to abduct Riley. In a nearby restroom, he brutally assaulted her, and in a moment of panic when his mask slipped off revealing his identity to Riley, he desperately decided to end her life. Sadly, Riley drowned in the creek where she was abandoned. The Will County detective is facing criticism for their flawed handling of the investigation, missing crucial leads and connections. They visited Scott's house on the date of his suicide attempt and asked it about Riley Fox, but they didn't link the two events. On November 10th, 2010, Scott Eby admitted to the killing and received a lifelong imprisonment sentence with no chance of parole. He gave up his right to appeal his sentence as part of a bargain.